I want to introduce this morning our first speaker, Dr. Joseph Landafi, who will make the opening remarks to start today's conference. Dr. Landafi's early career started as the chief resident of neurology at the University of Medicine and Dentistry of New Jersey. His fellow in neuro-oncology was done at Sloan Kettering, and he currently holds the following positions at JFK. He is an associate professor of neurology. He is the director of neuro-oncology. He is the medical director of JFK Gamma Knife Program, and he is the co-chair of the Cancer Pain Program, all at JFK. It was very easy today for, well, actually the last couple of weeks to go over who was going to speak, and it was very easy to pick some good doctors from this center. There was never any pressure, I just want people to know, there was never any pressure put on by JFK to have certain speakers. They were all picked by the committee group for this conference. And so we decided that Dr. Landafi should be our lead speaker today. He is the kind of doctor who will go all the way for his patients and one of the doctors who is making a difference in New Jersey for brain tumor patients. Please welcome Dr. Joseph Landafi. Thank you and good morning. When the lights went out, I was expecting a little soft music and candlelight, Dennis. <laughs> So I just wanted to welcome everybody here this morning. Um, I'll just throw out a few facts, and then we'll really get into the program, which is the most important part of the day. There are about 17,000 uh, new primary brain tumors diagnosed each year in the United States, with over 60% representing the malignant gliomas. The field of neuro-oncology, although it's been around for probably several decades, has really made some major strides in the last 10 years, involving therapeutic treatment options for chemotherapy, molecular targeting, and even uh, chromosomal analysis to determine prognosis and perhaps the way that we should be treating our patients. Meetings like the one today are important because they not only raise awareness, but they bring people together to discuss the various treatment options and issues. Focuses also should be on quality of life. So in my practice, I try to balance uh, quality of life issues with extension of life, and I think most neuro-oncologists across the country try to do that. I hope today's topics will bring increased understanding and attention to these topics. Today we're going to have Dr. Linda Lau as our keynote speaker who will be talking about brain tumor immunotherapy. <laughs> as you'll see in your program guide, uh, we'll be talking about surgical techniques, cognitive issues, and molecular targeting. We will also talk about nutrition meditation, and my favorite topic, making lemonade from lemons. Not only do I like lemonade and drink it almost on a daily basis, but in my own practice I find humor to be a very important part of treating my patients, uh, both for them and for me. Unfortunately, sometimes to a fault, as Patty Anthony will attest. I would like to thank the Central and Monmouth New Jersey Brain Tumor Support Groups, especially Stan and Virginia the Brain Tumor Society, and the Musella Foundation for bringing all of this together today. I would also like to thank JFK for hosting the event. Thank you for allowing me to participate, and I hope that you guys will find the day informative and productive. And if you guys want to ask questions of me or any of the other physicians that are here or any of the other speakers off you know, the time that they're speaking, please feel free to do so. I know I think I have some films I have to look at today. So if uh, we can have Dennis come back up uh, so that he can introduce our keynote speaker. Thank you very much for attending. Uh, it's a pleasure to introduce this woman. Her name is Dr. Linda Lau. She's come here from UCLA. In the brain tumor community, certain doctors are held in very high esteem by their peers. Dr. Linda Lau is one of them. I've been to many brain tumor conferences where she has presented her immunotherapy work, which has already made a difference for some patients. I had the pleasure of touring Dr. Lau's laboratory and spending some time with her about six months ago in LA. She is as nice as she is smart. Dr. Lau is currently associate professor in the division of neurosurgery at UCLA she is also the Director of Malignant Brain Tumor Program at UCLA. Dr. Lau has a long list of honors 
patents, grants, and inventions to her credit. We thought that you would find her work very interesting today. Please welcome Dr. Linda Lau as our keynote speaker. Thank you very much for that kind introduction. Um, I'm honored to be here today. Um, let me start by, you know, I'm going to talk to you about brain tumor immunotherapy uh, specifically, but also give you an overview of, of where we are, you know, in terms of brain tumor therapies and, and where I think we're, we're going in, in this field. So as you all know, the current treatments for brain tumors include surgery, radiation, and then uh, more recently, a standard chemotherapy, uh, Timidor, uh, has been recently approved. But there, there still remains great challenges, and, and the challenges are that despite current treatments and therapies, the median survival for patients with malignant brain tumors um, is still less than 15 months, and, and the five-year survival rate is, is still pretty dismal. So although we've made a lot of progress in the last five to ten years, um, you know, a lot more still needs to be done. So I'm going to start by, by talking a little bit about diagnosis. So, you know, why, why is, is diagnosis important? Well, I think... You know, one thing that has developed um, with the, uh, the, the better understanding of molecular genetics is that we're being able to diagnose brain tumors better. And recent advances in molecular biology have sub substantially improved our understanding of the molecular genetics of these neoplasms. And I think if we are able to diagnose these tumors better, we hopefully will be able to treat them better, and I'll go into details as to what I mean by that. So currently, um, as you may know, the, the diagnosis of brain tumors are based on somewhat subjective observations by, by uh, the pathologists, and uh, there actually have been studies whereby um, when, you look at, when you showed a, a pathology specimen to three different uh, neuropathologists, a third of the time they come up with different diagnoses. So, so the, the classic you know, characteristics that are, uh, are looked for, uh, and I'm referring, you know, specifically to primary brain tumors, are these characteristics of, uh, that are listed here. And uh, I want, just want to show you what that means, because when you read them in your pathology report, uh, you know, may, may, may be a little confusing, but one characteristic is that of nuclear atypia, and that just means that the nucleus look atypical. They're, they're large and, and bizarre looking compared to normal nuclei within a cell. Um, another characteristic that they look for is something called mitotic figures. If you remember biology, mitotic figures um, are, are the, uh, the you know, um, figures that you see when cells undergo division. That neovascular proliferation, new blood vessels that form within the tumor. And then the fourth characteristic is something called pseudopalisading necrosis. And if you kind of step back, you can kind of see this, I guess, what they term palisading. Uh, necrotic area within the tumor. So if you see all four of these characteristics, um, those are, are kind of pathognomonic for you know, what would be considered a glioblastoma. But as you can see, these are relatively subjective findings. So I think in the future, each pathological diagnosis of glioma, whether it be from a low-grade, grade 2 glioma to, to a glioblastoma, will have molecular genetic variations, and there's a lot, lots of papers in the literature now showing that this is indeed the case. Someday, each histopathological category um, of brain tumors may be further divided into subgroups according to similar genetic expression profiles. And the reason this is important is because in my practice, I, I have glioblastoma patients living eight, nine years, and then some, some only live six months. So even though it's the same diagnosis, you know, there's a huge variation in terms of prognosis, even for the same disease. Also um, in, in this realm of diagnosis, large-scale genomic approaches and new bioinformatics analysis methods may make it possible to develop um, not only molecular classifications of these tumors, um, both for treatment and prognosis, but also to identify biomarkers. I mean, eventually, someday, we may be able to have more markers that can be used to distinguish um, prognosis and also treatment response. And I'm just going to briefly talk about a couple that we're using um, at, at UCLA. Um, and it's also being commonly used uh, throughout the neuro-oncology community around the country. Uh, one is uh, microarray hybridization, or what, what's called the gene chip. 
So essentially, you know, what that is is a, is a glass slide where each dot actually represents a gene, a, a little piece of DNA. And what you could do is take a patient's tumor tissue or tumor cells, get the RNA from the cells, go through some, you know, molecular processing and actually plot out these tumor tissues uh, on, onto these arrays, and then you get through some, you know, um, sophisticated bioinformatics software, you could actually come up with a relative expression of these genes for a, any individual tumor. The, uh, the converse can also be done. Instead of putting genes on these little glass slides, you can actually put little pieces of tissue so that you could do hundreds uh, of patients' tissues um, all on one slide and then screen them for one particular gene. So, so you know, these, these new um, technologies hopefully will be advancing our, our understanding of these tumors and, and hopefully future treatments. So ultimately, once you have a better diagnosis, we can hopefully, uh, that'll hopefully lead to novel therapeutic treatments and, and in particular more targeted treatments than, than we've been used to in the past. So in terms of targeted treatments, there are, there are various classes of these treatments. Um, one are the, you know, the small molecule inhibitors. And you could actually uh, re recognize these by the, the trade name. They, they end in the word inib, um, and, uh, or, or the, uh, the generic name of these inhibitors. One, one common class is the EGFR inhibitors, which are tyrosine kinase inhibitors. And you may have heard of the term Tarceva or Irisa. These are our all EGFR inhibitors. Um, another drug that's, be, that's commonly being used now is a drug called Avastin, which is an anti-angiogenesis agent. It happens to be a, a VEGFR inhibitor, and uh, there, there's some new, new use for this in combination with chemotherapy drugs like CPT-11. Um, another class of targeted treatments are, are what's known as targeted toxins. Uh, one in particular is the IL-13 toxin. Um, that I know Dr. Dubinsky is going to talk about later uh, today, um, so, so I won't go into detail with that. But that is, uh, you know, another form of molecularly targeted treatments. And then what I'm going to talk about are the targeted treatments um, that are uh, immunological or under the broad category of immunotherapy. And those fall into two groups, either antibodies or vaccines or cellular therapies. So in terms of immunotherapeutic approaches, um, it, your immune system essentially is, is you know, composed of two components, your uh, humoral immune response and your cellular immune response. So under these two components, there are different treatment modalities that, that can fall um, you know, under either uh, an induction of humoral immunity or an induction of cellular immunity. In terms of the, so humoral has to do with you know, antibodies, essentially, if, if you hear that, that term. So antibody-based immunotherapy include uh, things like the radio-labeled uh, antibodies. That's essentially an antibody to a target on a tumor cell that's labeled with some sort of radioactivity to, to kill the tumor cell. Um, and there have been several trials uh, done in, in the last decade using these, these agents. Um, now there are antibodies to immunosuppressive targets. Um, one in particular is an anti-CTLA-4 antibody. Uh, that's actually being used in metastatic melanoma, not yet being used in glioma, but um, in the future it, it may be. And what that does is it actually targets the, suppress the immune suppressor cells that may uh, lead to uh, the, basically the, your immune system not recognizing your tumor cell. And then there are antibodies to molecular targets. Um, uh, the, the most uh, you know, well-known ones are Herceptin, which is you know, commonly used for breast cancer, and uh, Herbitux. Um, and then we move on to cellular immuno immunotherapeutic approaches. And there are two, two general categories. One is, is what, what we term passive, and one is what we term active. And then I'll go again into details a little bit of what that means. But passive immunity means that you would activate the immune cell outside the body, and then using that activated immune cell, which is activated against your tumor, uh, passively transfer that to the host or to the patient. Um, a tumor vaccine works a little bit differently in the sense that it's essentially a vaccine, just like a, you know, the pol a polio vaccine or chickenpox vaccine. What you're trying to do is actually mount an immune response 
in, in the host, in the patient, uh, against uh, his or her tumor. And there are four phases of an immune response, and this is true for both the humoral and the cellular arm of the immune system. First, there's a recognition initiation phase, and that's when the, the immune response recognizes the antigen. Um, it could be a virus, it could be a bacteria. In this particular context, we're talking about a tumor antigen. And then once there's a recognition of the antigen, the, the cells, whether it be B cells or T cells, will proliferate and migrate um, as necessary. And that's, this is essentially how we all fight off infections. And, so, and, uh, and there's a theory that all of us have tumor cells circulating in our body, but our immune response is able to keep it under control so it doesn't become a, a full-blown tumor. And of these cells, the B cells make antibodies, and the T cells can uh, convert into what's called cytotoxic T cells, or T lymphocytes, or killer T cells. And then ultimately what we want is, is for these, uh, this immune response to enter a memory phase so that your immune system recognizes these tumor cells in the, in, in the future, and if they come back, your immune system is able to get rid of them. Because as you all know, the, the treatment the, the difficulty of treating a, a glioma is not necessarily the initial treatment. We can do surgery, we can do radiation and chemotherapy, but the problem is that these tumors keep coming back. So we need to devise some way to keep them from coming back. So passive immunotherapy essentially is the process of administering these antibodies or cytotoxic lymph, you know, killer T cells uh, into the into the patient, uh, either into the tumor bed or systemically in order to kill these tumor cells. And active immunotherapy actually starts out here um, because what you really want is to have your immune system recognize the tumor, the tumor antigens. And there are some potential advantages to both. Um, the advantages to active immunotherapy is that you can induce this systemic immunity so it's, it's not lo you know, local just to the tumor uh, bed, uh, you can potentially induce long-term immunologic memory, which is essentially what we want. We want something that will prevent the tumor from coming back in the future. And then um, there's the concept that you can induce dynamic immune recognition via uh, an immunologic uh, concept called epitope spreading. I'm not going to get into the details of this, um, it's, uh, but uh, if any of you are interested, um, I could talk to you about it later. But um, so t taking all of that, what we've done in the last uh, about eight years uh, is worked on a, a type of tumor vaccine uh, that's based upon uh, these immune cells called dendritic cells. And the concept here is, is pretty simple. It's, it's the concept that tumors have immunogenic antigens. There's something on the tumor cell that's different from a normal cell, and your body should be able to recognize it. Unfortunately, the tumors um, themselves are poor antigen-presenting cells, meaning the T cells, for some reason, do not recognize the tumor cells. So the dendritic cell is, is essentially a professional antigen-presenting cell that's able to process these tumor antigens into a form that can be recognized by T cells. And as we learn more about immunology, what you know, T cells need is the antigen in a very specific format in order to get activated. So what are dendritic cells? They are essentially the profession, professional antigen-presenting cells in your body. They're, they're, they're normal cells that, that circulate in your body. Um, they come from the bone marrow just like any other uh, immune cells. Um, and then they, they mature and migrate uh, to uh, peripheral organs um, such, such as your skin, the lining of your gut. The, these are essentially the cells that capture bacteria and viruses and other foreign antigens that, that uh, your body needs to get rid of. Once they capture the antigen, then they then go, migrate either through the bloodstream or through the lymph nodes to secondary lymphoid organs, which are essentially the lymph nodes in your body or, or the spleen, and this is where your T cells reside. The antigen-presenting cell thereby um, activates the T cell by, by uh, presenting the antigen, and the T cell, once activated, are the, the soldiers of the immune response. They're the ones that can circulate around your, your body uh, and uh, around your brain uh, to, to seek out those uh, residual tumor cells. So there, there's actually been a lot of work uh, on dendritic cell-based tumor vaccines for, for um, all sorts of cancers. 
um, and they're, they've, even, they, they've either been done in vivo or ex vivo. In vivo means inside the body or outside the body. For uh, in vivo activation of dendritic cells, there are agents that can basically increase the number of dendritic cells in the body, such as GMCSF or, or certain chemokines. <laughs> Um, and these agents are injected into patients um, in hopes that with an increased number of these antigen-presenting cells, they can uh, pick up tumor antigen uh, and uh, present T cells. This probably doesn't work for brain tumors um, because the antigen-presenting cell doesn't necessarily get into the tumor because of the blood-brain barrier and various other issues. So for brain tumors, this actually has to be done ex vivo, meaning outside of the body. So essentially, you have to take the cells out of the bloodstream, they, these, uh, grow them in cell culture, and then put them together with the tumor antigens that you know, we could obtain from surgery. And that is what is injected back into patients uh, in order to uh, uh, induce an immune response. So it's essentially an antigen and an antigen-presenting cell that we put together um, outside the body and inject back into patients. Um, we started this work in animal models pro about six or seven years ago, and we did see that in animal models there was a, um, an increased uh, survival rate um, of, patient, of the uh, animals injected with this uh, antigen pulse dendritic cell, and 25% of the animals essentially were, were cured of the disease with, with no further tumor progression. So from, from the animal data, we went on to do phase one clinical trials. And essentially, this is, what, this is the trial paradigm. Uh, a patient would undergo surgery. And, um, and then after they've completed their radiation uh, treatments they, they, and uh, are off of the decadron, they, they undergo a leukophoresis, where, um, whereby we, we make these dendritic cells in cell culture. We have the patient's tumor tissue from the, the, the surgery. So we culture the dendritic cells with the tumor antigens, and that is what is injected back into patients. Um, we've done two, two sets of phase one trials. This is our initial set of 12 patients. And we were able to show you know, immunologic responses in several of these patients and, and infiltration of T cells into the tumor. And uh, these are the, the survivals um, of these patients. All these patients had grade four glioblastoma. Um, so they had the most malignant type of, of uh, glioma. And we have one patient out over five years with no evidence of recurrence, and several patients who were you know, over two or three years. And then some who basically uh, continue to have progression of disease. So it, it's... Uh, I think it, it shows some promising results, but a lot more work needs to be done in terms of how to optimize this treatment um, you know, for, for patients in general. Uh, it's, it, as many of you may know, glioblastoma is a very devastating disease, and, and uh, in, in terms of getting a treatment, it's really, you're really fighting the odds here uh, in terms of uh, affecting a cure. But the fact that we're able to prolong survival in some of these patients, I think, is encouraging. Um, we were, did see some objective responses, uh, pre-vaccination and post-vaccination. Uh, more interestingly, what we, were, what we saw is that the patients who lived longer, meaning the patients that lived over two years, did show an immune response to the tumor after vaccination. So this is the immune response against, basically what we did was we cultured the T cells and tumor cells in, in a Petri dish and, see, and looked to see how, how the T cells killed the tumor cells. And um, the patients that lived longer had an increase in their, uh, in their T cell killing of, brain, of their brain tumor. We also looked at specific antigens. Um, as I started this, this talk, I talked about targets being important. So what we, were what we were also looking at is what targets within the tumors that we can use uh, as antigens both to target these vaccines to and also to monitor response. Um, one, one gene that seems to be expressed in, in, um, in about 70 to 80 percent of these tumors um, is a gene called GP100. So what we found was that um, before treatment, uh, patients, uh, for instance, had 0.41% of their T cells reactive to this protein, to this GP100 protein, after treatment that was increased. 
granted, these numbers look small, but we're talking about the whole population of your, your T cells. Basically, being able to increase the billions and billions of T cells in your body, you know, by a certain percentage that target your, the specific tumor, um, I think is significant. How much of that is necessary, we don't know yet, but, um, but you know, we are able to show, at least in these patients, that the, the vaccination does make a difference in that regard. Um, another target we looked at is a, a protein called CMV. And as you can see, the, for, for this patient, uh, the T cells responsive to this gene in the tumor went up from 0.2% of all the T cells in his body to 1.3%. So, um, so there's a significant increase in terms of the number of T cells that could attack the tumor. And another thing we noticed is that patients who live longer, you know, meaning you know, over two years versus under one year, tended to have more T cells um, or these immune cells enter their tumor. So, so theoretically, these, these uh, tumors are being attacked by the immune system, which is essentially what we want. However, not all patients with an increased immune response um, were necessarily living longer. And I think one problem is that the tumor itself is fighting back. The tumor obviously wants to survive, and it secretes factors that are is suppressing the immune response. And what we found was that this particular um, agent, TGF-beta, which is an immunosuppressive agent that has been long documented to be secreted by, by brain tumors, um, seems to correlate with decreased survival. The one patient that, that I had that's over five years out is, is number five, and she essentially had no TGF-beta in her tumor, which made, made her an ideal candidate for this kind of therapy because her tumor was not secreting any immunosuppressive agents that would hinder this immune response from occurring. So in the future, you know, there are trials where we're, you know, using combinations of agents that suppress uh, agents like TGF-beta in combination with vaccine therapies in order to enhance this response. So uh, preliminary, here's the survival data of uh, our control patients. These are basically all, you know, the patients at UCLA treated over the last five years uh, with glioblastoma compared to the patients on the, you know, on the clinical trial. This is our first clinical trial, and this is our second trial. Um, our second trial is still ongoing. The results look a little better on the second trial, and, and, uh, um, and the reason is between this trial and the second trial, what's happened in the neuro-oncology world is the standardization of uh, Timidar concurrent with radiation therapy. Basically, people are, you know, in the second trial were getting Timidar. Um, with radiation uh, before before the vaccination, and I think that does make a difference in in uh, in this particular immunotherapy, and also, also I think in immunotherapies in general. And I'll I'll, I'll go into to why that is. So that was time to tumor progression, and this is survival. Again, we're seeing better survivals, uh, slightly better in our first phase one trial, and now you know even better in our second set of phase one trials. So based on, on those phase one, that phase one data, we actually now have a, uh, are, are starting a multi-center phase two trial. Uh, the, this trial has now been being take over, taken over by a, a company in Washington State called Northwest Biotherapeutics. And, um, you know, initially I was always very hesitant to, to you know, do these kind of things with, with industry. But one thing that I realized is in order for this type of treatment to get out to the the public to get out to centers beyond the very isolated academic centers like UCLA and other places, we need to have a place that centrally makes this vaccine and that could be that whereby it could be distributed to to hospitals throughout the country, and that's why these companies, you know, I think eventually will become important. Um, and this, for this particular trial, the vaccine is being made in a uh, in a cell, cellular therapy manufacturing company in, in Sunnyvale, California. Um, as you may have heard, we, in California, with the stem cell initiative, we're, we're actually having a, a huge influx of, of companies interested in cellular therapies. And I think this will be one um, avenue whereby we can use this uh, to the advantage of brain tumor patients. So the trial essentially is going to involve 10 to 12 participating centers, and that will include UCLA, MD Anderson, Duke, um, Johns Hopkins, and, uh, and hopefully a couple uh, centers here in, in New York and uh, maybe New Jersey. Uh, it's going to enroll 145 patients in the treatment arm with 145 concurrent controls. So it's going to be a prospective 
uh, control match trial. What patients will undergo is initially surgery. And now because of the results of our second phase one trial showing that the efficacy may be better with uh, patients that undergo radiation with concurrent Timidor, the patients who undergo surgery, there's six weeks of radiation with Timidor, will wait a couple weeks, and then they'll undergo their leukophoresis, and then these injections, which will initially be done every two weeks for the first six weeks, um, and then they can actually go back on Timidor uh, two months after that, and then we are actually planning to do booster injections uh, in between Timidor doses every three months thereafter. So what have we learned so far in the, the last you know, seven to eight years in, term, in, you know, in, in running this trial? Well, what we've learned is that these you know, immunotherapeutic approaches can induce tumor-specific immune responses in the host, and we've, we've shown that uh, our group, as, long as, uh, as well as various other groups throughout the country, have shown that that is possible as measured by objective assays. Um, the immune response, however, uh, does not necessarily translate to objective clinical response in brain tumor patients. And I think the reason that is is because of, of the immunosuppressive factors that the brain tumor secretes and, and various other uh, factors that are inherent within the host. So I think the host, meaning the, the, the tumor patient and the tumor microenvironment, needs to be taken into consideration uh, with any of these therapies. So... Putting that in a larger context, what have we learned from brain tumor clinical trials in the past five, five years or so? Well, not, novel therapies, meaning these targeted agents, whether it be small molecule inhibitors, antibodies, um, and vaccines, so far, unfortunately, have not shown much efficacy as single agents. Um, you, you know, we, we've done probably two dozen trials of various agents, um, including IRISA, Tarceva, um, and CPT11, and go, go on and on. Um, and as single agents, you know, nothing's really coming out um, other than, than Timidar, which, you know, now is FDA approved. Um, however, they may be effective in combination with standard therapies or with each other. And uh, when, when uh, you know, when... Uh, Example of that uh, that's recently been prevalent is the combination of CBT, CPT11 and an anti-angiogenesis agent, Avastin. Uh, we're seeing, you know, in, in the neuro-oncology community some, some reasonably impressive objective responses to this combination. What that will turn out to be in the long run, it's too early to see. But I think, you know, in the future, it's going to be a combination of this and, you know, of these approaches along with the immunotherapeutic approaches and others. So, as I mentioned, I think the future of brain tumor therapy will involve a combination of pro approaches. It's not going to be any one treatment modality in isolation. And that's one thing that I think neurosurgeons and neuro-oncologists and radiation oncologists, you know, are, need to realize and are beginning to realize that it's not going to be a, a silver bullet that will cure this disease. So, you know, it will involve the standard treatments um, and then perhaps targeted biologic agents. And again, so the targeted agents probably are going to be effective for certain populations of patients um, and not for others. For instance, something that inhibits EGFR would probably be effective for someone whose tumor happens to have EGFR overexpression. Um, and not for patients that don't. So, so I think this will be, you know, a little better defined in the next uh, next several years. And then on top of that, yeah, immunotherapy uh, will hopefully pay, play a role in terms of keeping the tumor from coming back. And the rationale behind that is actually a, a concept uh, that's actually very common in cancer. It's the whole concept of log kill, being able to kill as many, you know, tumor cells as possible to get to a point where your immune, immune system can essentially get rid of what's left. So initially, you know, there are billions and trillions of tumor cells in a big bulk of tumor. The first line of treatment there is essentially surgery to debulk or to, to decrease the tumor load. Um, I'm a little biased here because I'm a neurosurgeon, but I do think that surgeon is, is, surgery does play a role here um, and a, a pretty significant role. Um, and then, but then even after surgery, surgery itself is not going to cure this disease. The problem is these resistant cells will start to grow back. So you need to hit them again with the second treatment modality, such as radiation. Um, again, even despite radiation, the tumors will grow back. So then we go on to drug therapy. So hopefully what that does is decreases tumor load down to a level 
and, and the quoted level is about 10,000 cells, although, you know, that's theoretical, um, and it may be more or less depending on the patient and the patient's immune system. And that's probably why younger patients tend to do better. They, they have a better immune system. But if you can decrease that load down to a level whereby your immune system can, can rid it, I think that's where we can hopefully someday uh, come to a cure to, the, of the, to this disease. So I'm just going to spend the last few minutes talking about surgery because I do believe that that is really the first line in terms of debulking this tumor and, and, and getting it to a point where where you, it will become manageable with any subsequent treatments. I don't think you're going to see a large 8-centimeter tumor go away with immunotherapy or with any agents, but I think surgery has, you know, will give you that initial chance. So in terms of surgery, there's, there's the issue of um, anatomical localization, basically knowing the anatomy of the brain and where the tumor is in relation to the anatomy of the brain. And then functional and metabolic lo localization, basically knowing what part of the brain is tumor and what part isn't, and also what part of the brain controls vital functions, because those are the things that we don't want it to destroy with, with any of these treatments. So in terms of surgery and neuronavigation, uh, nowadays, as, as it is used in, in pretty much um, all the, the, the major neurosurgical hospitals in, in, the, in the country, there, there are neuro, these neuronavigational units. They're typically these computer modules that look like this. And essentially what it is is it's like GPS for the brain. I don't know if any of you have GPS in your car, but, but I just got it in mind, and I love it. Um, <laughs> and uh, what it does is it actually tells you exactly where you are in the brain um, so that you know precisely where you are within a person's tumor. And, you know, this, this sounds, you know, pretty obvious, uh, the utility of this, but, you know, five years ago this wasn't as commonly used. And because of that, I think, you know, the, the results we were getting from brain tumor um, surgeries was not as good because we, we couldn't be as precise in terms of the localization. So this is what it looks, that the screen looks like in the operating room. There's a pointer where you could point to any particular area of the patient's brain, and it shows up on the screen. So we know exactly where we are, and that's what the pointer looks like. The pointer has two little spheres that actually registers to these infrared cameras that are situated in the operating room. So, so these act like the satellites that allow us to know where we are in the brain. And this is what we see on the screen, um, basically where, where that pointer tip is in terms of where the target is in the brain. And you know, now with the you know, sophisticated software, we could do 3D uh, reconstructions and renderings and rotate this in all, all different angles. Um, so that, that helps us in terms of anatomical localization. Now, the, the, another issue is that even if you know anatomically where you are, you're not sure sometimes what's tumor and what's not, or what's the most aggressive part of the tumor and what's not. And that's where um, metabolic or, or functional uh, or, and other imaging modalities come into play. Uh, one, one such uh, imaging modality is something called MR spectroscopy. And uh, if you remember high school chemistry, you know, and having to uh, interpret spectra of uh, various chemical comp you know, components, th what this is is essentially an MR scan that can tell you what the chemical composition is of certain areas of the brain. And what's known or what's believed is that tumors have a high choline peak. Um, so because that's a, a membrane protein and it's, very, it's, it's a component of cells. So, for instance, in this particular patient of mine, she presented with this, this scan, had a little abnormality here and something in the midline, and it was actually difficult from this to determine, well, where should we do the, do the biopsy to get the best diagnosis? So we did a, an MR spectroscopy scan, and what it showed was that the highest choline peak was not out here, but it was actually right here in the middle, even though you know, the, the abnormality looked more abnormal out here. So I biopsied both areas, and this area actually was a low-grade uh, glioma, but then when we biopsied that area, it turned out to be a glioblastoma. So without this information, you know, probably very likely you do the biopsy at the most more superficial area, but could potentially miss, miss the, the uh, more serious diagnosis in this patient. This is another patient who had a previous resection, 
and then uh, radiation therapy. And then the issue was, well, was this area um, radiation necrosis or was it tumor? When we did the spectroscopy, what we found is actually the most aggressive area was right along here. And as you can see, that area doesn't even contrast enhance. But that area, you know, upon biopsy was, was the, uh, the recurrent glioblastoma, whereas this area was all just dead, dead tissue radiation necrosis. So, so these kind of tools do help us in terms of, you know, knowing where to best biopsy these, these tumors and getting the most accurate diagnosis. PET scan is another um, modality that's used to differentiate tumor from non-tumor areas. Um, the conventional, you know, like I said, standard MRI looks at anatomy and structure, but it doesn't really tell you much about function. Um, PET scan, uh, you know, does do that. The traditional PET scan is something called FDG PET, and that stands for fluorodeoxyglucose. So basically, you know, it's glucose that's injected into your body, and then the areas of tumor pick up more glucose because tumor cells need glucose in order to, to grow and divide, and that's, um, that's what's uh, used conventionally in PET scans. Um, at UCLA, we're all actually also looking at different tra other tracers, including thymidine and uh, F-DOPA PET, and that's because not all uh, tumors um, are actually well picked up by, by PET scans, at least standard PET. So, so we're looking at different other agents whereby this can be better um, visualized and utilized. And this is one, one case in point. Um, what we found in, in a relatively large series now is that these F-DOPA PETs um, are more sensitive than traditional FDG or glucose PETs for picking out low-grade tumors. This is a patient with some, a lesion right in that right frontal area, which is actually cold on FDG PET. So, you know, one, one thought is that maybe this, you know, isn't a tumor. It could be an infection, a stroke, or some other process. But on the F-DOPA PET, we actually saw that the two, there was a high, high uptake on, on this PET. And, and when I operated, this patient did turn out to have um, a, uh, a low-grade glioma. So that, th those are modalities to distinguish tumor from normal brain. Um, now what we want to do as well is distinguish functional from non-functional brain, meaning areas of the brain that you need in terms of uh, daily functions, you know, motor skills, language skills, and, and so forth. So, you know, what the, the most commonly used modality now is what's called functional MRI. This is a patient of mine with a tumor, um, which... You know, five years ago, you know, would, would probably have been considered inoperable because it was so close to his primary language and motor areas. And we did a functional MRI that confirmed that this is his motor and, and his language areas. And you could see the tumors right in between. So, you know, we're talking millimeters of, uh, of room in terms of how, how to uh, take this tumor out without dam damaging normal brain areas. So, you know, again, with all the advances in, in computer technology these days, what, what we're able to do for, tu for tumors like this is actually map not only the functional areas on the cortex of the brain, but the white matter tracks that, that lead from the cortex, you know, through the, uh, or alongside the tumor. So basically go in and surgically dissect right along the tumor without damaging these, these fiber tracks. And this is a, a picture of the, uh, an intra picture of that particular case. His language areas were right up to that area there, and his motor areas were, were right behind the tumor. The tumor is right in between the two. We did this case awake with him talking and moving so that we knew that this we would not cause any permanent damage to him. And postoperatively, he, he did fine. Um, this was another patient uh, of mine who had a tumor here in the, the left frontal area. Um, if you want to read more details about it, it's actually, this patient's actually featured in the March issue of National Geographic. Um, so you can see the, the tumor here, that bul bulging area there, and then uh, this was her language area. And what was interesting about this, this particular case is that she spoke two languages. She spoke English and Spanish. English was in an A, and Spanish was in B. So... 
so language, you know, and for those of you who do, you know, speak multiple languages, what we're finding is that language is not only not in the same area in, in every patient, but different languages, depending on what time in life you learned your language, is, is located in different areas in the brain. So, so the, the mapping techniques that have, have arisen in the last, you know, five years have, are extremely sophisticated now in terms of how well we can localize language and, you know, and, and uh, pretty much any other function that, you know, patients want to preserve. Um, and that has made what's, you know, called inoperable tumors, you know, operable. So I don't think it's because we're any better as surgeons. I think that the, uh, the technology's come such a long way that we can do this. And now the next iteration of, you know, safer, more complete surgeries will, you know, is, is now in the realm of intraoperative MRI. So basically what that is is, um, and you see, at UCLA we actually have two of them, uh, what that is is actually an operating room whereby there's an MRI, you know, in the corner. And what that allows us to do is basically get an MRI during the surgery to update our, our GPS, our, our, you know, neuronavigational instrument. Because as you can imagine, if you're taking out an 8-centimeter tumor, after, you know, half the tumor's out, the brain has shifted, and, uh, and there's quite a, a bit of distortion, so you can't really use your preoperative MRI to measure that kind of distortion, especially if your accuracy, you know, if you want to be within millimeter accuracy. So what, what we're able to do now is actually get an MRI during surgery uh, to, and update the, uh, the neuronavigational instrument. So it's, it's essentially like real-time satellite. And we're able to use, you know, our usual tools, the intraoperative micro, the microscope and, and uh, all the other equipment that we typically use. And uh, so this is the, the UCLA MRI suite. There's the MRI there. Um, it essentially looks just like a regular um, OR room. And uh, you know, what that allows us to do is to do, you know, very sophisticated you know, mapping. And, and in this particular case, i just run a, through a little clip of what happens. I'm able to operate here. This is our neuropsychologist testing the patient uh, for language. And um, in this particular patient, he happened to have been um, a, a professional musician. So what he wanted, more than, more than just being able to talk, is to be able to read music. I mean, that essentially was his, his profession for the last 30 years. So we tested, you know, his, his ability to read music uh, during, and, and to, to sing and, and to, to hum notes during the, uh, the procedure. And as you can see, the, you know, the patient is rotated into the MRI and then we're able, the radiologist is able to look at the scans right then and there. And the reason that that's important is because um, if you ask your neurosurgeons, I'm sure they've had a lot of these cases, and because I know I have in the past, whereby you 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 know take out the majority of the tumor, you think you're done, but there's a little bit left behind, that extra 20 percent, and uh, usually we close and you know we tell patients, oh, we weren't able to get that last 20 percent. Well. A lot of times it's because we couldn't see it. Um, and what this, you know, intraoperative MRI does is al allows us to see it before closing. And you can see this patient is, is he's, you know, the, the skin flap is still open uh, when we got that MRI scan. And, uh, and, you know, even though I thought I got all the tumor out, there's a little bit left. Went back in and took it out and essentially got a, got a complete resection. So, you know, I think this will hopefully make a difference uh, in terms of patient survival in the future. I know there's been controversy as to how useful surgery is for something like a glioblastoma, but I don't think we've had in the past this kind of precision uh, in terms of surgical resection. So in conclusion, uh, neurosurgical technology has advanced to allow safer, more complete surgeries for patients with brain tumors. And surgery, like I, I mentioned, is the first step in a patient-centered team approach to these tumors. And I think, you know, like, again, I want to reiterate, I think the f future of brain tumor therapy is going to be in a combination of, of all these things. 
This is a patient of mine with enlarged tumor. I don't believe a tumor like this is going to go away with uh, just vaccine therapy or, or uh, targeted molecular inhibitors. So I think what you, we need to do is to first take it out so that you have very few residual tumor cells and then treat the residual with radiation therapy and then drug therapy, whether it you know, be Timidor or you know, more, more targeted agents in the future. And then the role of immunotherapy will be the, the, the T cells or the immune response to attack the residual tumor cells that are in those fingers that we can't see and we can't surgically take out. And again, I know this is probably preaching to the choir here, but you know, research is really you know, what we need to do here. We need to basically take what we do in the operating room and in, in patients, take that back to the lab, study them molecularly, genetically, immunologically, and then translate like that as quickly as we can back to patients. And this is essentially uh, you know, what, what, uh, what my lab does um, at UCLA. I want to thank all my collaborators. Again, this is not something that, that any, any person does alone. Um, and all, you know, all, all the uh, major brain tumor groups have a, a huge group of people working with them. And I also want to thank you for coming and uh, listening to my talk. <laughs>